Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, this is our, our first and, and maybe maybe not our only, but right now it's our only planned uh, Power Struggle Utility Accountability Summit for Ohio. We've had many of these across, or we've got many of these planned at least across the country, uh, but it's of most importance here in Ohio as we've uh, gone through many struggles uh, in the last few years as it relates to uh, utilities and, and how we keep them accountable and, and what their structures are. and uh, I'm Tristan, I'm with Solar United Neighbors. We're one of the groups that's facilitating this discussion here today. Uh, part of our reason for doing this, one of our missions at Solar United Neighbors is to provide education around renewable energy and, uh, and utilities in general, and utility, utility accountability. So today we brought together a couple of the, the leaders really in, the, in this space here in Ohio, um, from Ohio University, the uh, Energy and Policy Institute and Ohio Environmental Council to, to lead us in a discussion and talk about um, some of the ways that we might even begin to address some of these issues as we move forward. So um, before we get too far, I want to mention before we even talk about who our, our folks are today who are going to be speaking, um, we want this to be a discussion. So please, as we go, uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll collect those questions. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session uh, with our panelists. And I'd love to be able to point some of those questions at them and we can start to sort of answer those as we go. Once we get to the Q&A session, we'll also uh, be taking questions verbally. So if you have a question at that time, there's a little raise your hand button, push that, raise your hand, and you can ask your question out loud uh, should you want to do it that way. So that's how we'll we'll run today. And uh, without too much of further ado, let's look at what we'll be getting into. Uh, first up, we'll have Gilbert. Uh, say your last name. I don't, I've never actually been able to pronounce it correct. Uh, it's Michaud. Michaud. Oh, yes. Well. Assistant Professor uh, at, of Practice at Ohio University. He'll be giving us an introduction into Ohio utilities and regulations. Then we'll have David Anderson. Uh, he's the Policy and Communications Manager at Energy and Policy Institute. He'll be digging into Ohio utility corruption and all the craziness that's happened up to this point and, and give us a real good, thorough understanding of what's happening. Um, and then we'll have our very own Randy Lapla. Well, I don't work for the Ohio Environmental Council, but I, I feel like I do speaking with her on nearly a weekly basis and all kinds of issues that pertain to uh, environment in, in the state of Ohio here as their VP of energy policy. Uh, and she's gonna talk a little bit about, about how we might uh, address this or fix these issues moving forward. And again, I'm Tristan, I'll be your moderator, just keeping things moving in the right direction. So uh, without further, too much further ado, what, I'll, what I need to do is switch PowerPoints over to uh, Gilbert's. So I'll stop sharing. And I will turn it over to Gilbert while I get this set up. Yeah, thanks, Tristan. Uh, I'm assuming you're sharing my slides, is that correct? Yes, I am just okay. now starting to do that. Very good, yeah. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gilbert Michaud, and I'm a professor at the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs. Uh, yeah, they're at Ohio University. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and thanks for the invitation, Tristan. This is really important, uh, you know, initiative and work that you guys are working on. So uh, for folks unfamiliar with the Voinovich School, we're a very applied and engaged uh, public policy, public affairs school. And so uh, we do a, a lot of sort of uh, work uh, with partners, including industry, environmental nonprofits, state and local government, and a lot of other folks. And uh, my background and interest is in economics, public policy, and I've been really plugged into sort of the energy policy uh, scene here in Ohio for several years uh, working on these issues. So uh, again, happy to be here. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please, Tristan. So yeah, so my uh, goal today, everyone, is to sort of introduce you to some of these uh, topics and themes. Uh, we're talking about electric utilities, obviously, and uh, corruption and uh, money and lobbying, et cetera. And so I wanted to provide a bit of a framework for folks to build off of uh, as we segue to our other panelists. Uh, and so uh, electric utilities can be broken down, and I'm generalizing a bit, but into three sort of main types, right? Uh, first, we have our IOUs, our investor-owned utilities, and these are our very big, you know, often uh, multi-state, for-profit, private uh, companies uh, in Ohio, you know, we're thinking of folks like AEP Ohio, First Energy, which will be a topic of discussion today, of course, Dayton Power and Light and a few others. And again, these are uh, really large players in sort of the uh, electric utility realm uh, and are regulated by uh, public utilities commissions, which I'll talk about in a second. 
Uh, we also have co-ops, which are really important uh, and are very prevalent, um, especially in the Midwest and the Western states. And we have co-ops here in Ohio, South Central Power Company is one, uh, and sort of Southern and uh, Southeastern Ohio. Uh, and these are a little bit different. A lot of them are uh, distribution only. Uh, they were uh, largely established you know, 80, 90 years ago or so uh, as uh, part of the 1935 Rural Electrification Act. And they're largely in rural areas were set up as nonprofit organizations. Uh, that have member owners uh, and, and serve uh, those sort of customers or members uh, rather than uh, sort of shareholders, right? And then we also see uh, munis or municipal utilities. Typically, these are owned by a city or a town, uh, you know, Cleveland Public Power, City of Orville, City of X or Village of X utilities. And uh, basically, cities can have their own uh, electric utilities in addition uh, to be comprehensive to things like gas and water, uh, et cetera. So, uh, when we think about sort of how we got to where we are today with regard to utilities, uh, it's important to sort of go back in time and think about, uh, you know, about 100 years ago when uh, this uh, short sort of shift to alternating current uh, in the early 1900s allowed for more long distance transmission, right? And so we started to build a lot of these really large power plants, uh, coal-fired power plants, eventually a nuke plants, et cetera. Uh, to sort of decrease, uh, you know, uh, building costs, uh, uh, increase economies of scale, uh, use uh, these large power plants to ship electricity to folks in cities and all around the country. Uh, and so we saw a lot of uh, utilities, uh, in essence, forming at that time, but of course, uh, monopolies are illegal. And so we uh, came up with this concept, uh, Insul did, uh, with sort of, quote unquote, regulated monopolies, right? And then public utilities commissions at the state level, sometimes called public service commissions, uh, state corporation commissions in some states, et cetera, to regulate these big utilities and control prices. Uh, next slide, Tristan. And so uh, this was sort of uh, created uh, with the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935, again, making states responsible for regulating these utilities, right? Uh, they're doing things like approving rates. Uh, I could have shown the uh, sort of service area, service territory map here in Ohio, which is, we kind of joke that it's a Swiss cheese of all these different utilities all over the place that, uh, depending on where you live, you know, you're an AEP customer or you're a co-op customer, et cetera. Uh, but again, we're sort of focused on the big utilities, the AEPs and First Energies today. Uh, and traditionally, these were set up as sort of, you know, vertically integrated utilities is what we call them. Uh, they are sort of in charge of all of these different uh, pieces, right, in terms of the generation assets, uh, the power plants, transmission and distribution, uh, and serving retail customers. And uh, this started to change and evolve a bit in the 70s with PURPA and uh, you know, market restructuring and deregulation that happened in a lot of states in the 90s. And I don't wanna dive too far into this, but uh, we are uh, actually a deregulated state uh, here in Ohio, which means uh, you do have a little bit more flexibility uh, to determine your generation provider. But a lot of folks uh, are unaware of that, don't take advantage of it. And for all intents and purposes, a lot of these big utilities are still uh, you know, sort of uh, serving as these large uh, monopolies. Uh, next slide, Tristan. And so uh, let's talk about some of the key sort of regulators, right? These key governmental institutions uh, in uh, Ohio energy policy. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio is our Public Utilities Commission. I already mentioned Public Utilities Commissions. Uh, and so the PUCO is sort of that agency here uh, in the state of Ohio. We also have uh, the OPSB, the Ohio Power Siting Board. I do a lot of work with them. Uh, they are sort of a, a sister agency that is responsible for siting energy and electricity infrastructure, right? So we're thinking about pipelines, we're thinking about new generation assets coming online, utility scale solar projects size larger than 50 megawatts, for instance, uh, et cetera. And uh, in many states, including Ohio, uh, one of the key players, of course, is sort of the legislature and the executive, right? Or the General Assembly and the governor's office. And this is sort of the legislative body that's implementing public policy passing bills, enacting laws, et cetera. And uh, obviously here in Ohio, we have our House of Representatives and uh, the Ohio Senate as well. And so these are sort of uh, some of the key institutions uh, worth noting in this discussion. Next slide. And so uh, I've actually done a lot of work trying to understand sort of public policy around clean energy and uh, institutions and their environments. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of different folks uh, in this game, you know, pursuing their own interests and agendas. Uh, the utilities, especially the very large investor-owned utilities, as I mentioned, uh, really have a ton of power uh, through uh, hired lobbyists and, and big money and deep pockets that they have. Uh, we have a lot of other folks 
the solar industry and developers. We have nonprofit environmental groups such as Randy's group uh, that are really good at sort of mobilizing people uh, and doing outreach and education. Uh, but the utilities are still really dominant with regard to uh, dollars, right? They're talking to these regulators, uh, as mentioned on the prior slide. Uh, they're forming relationships with folks and they're really influencing uh, outcomes through things like campaign contributions, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, at, at many uh, states, including Ohio, this is at the expense of a lot of things that would serve uh, sort of the citizenry well, right? Like installing distributed generation or community solar gardens, uh, et cetera. And so they want to sort of maintain their monopolistic uh, stranglehold of electricity markets. And so uh, we'll do everything that they possibly can to sort of stifle competition. Next slide, please. And I've actually done uh, a lot of work on this uh, myself in the past, uh, just as a quick example through the lens of community solar policy or enabling legislation. Uh, a few years ago, I did a, a big study where I interviewed folks from utilities, from government, from environmental groups, solar industry, and, and many others, uh, and asked folks about the barriers to you know, clean energy policy at the state level. Uh, and you can see very clearly on the uh, left-hand side of your screen on this image that it really is the utilities and sort of their money power uh, that is dominating uh, these markets and uh, stifling things like innovation and clean energy policy. Um, and so it's really interesting, even the utilities themselves, as you see on the red uh, piece of that bar, uh, claimed that they were lobbying against things like uh, clean energy. And so if folks are interested, I have a paper there in the middle and uh, got a little bit of media coverage last summer as well, which was, which was interesting. Uh, next slide, Tristan. So uh, I'll wrap up here. Again, I wanted to sort of you know, lay some of these foundations and set the groundwork for uh, Dave and Randy. And I don't want to steal too much of their thunder, but uh, of course, uh, you know, we've had a lot of corruption and sort of uh, scandals as it relates to House Bill 6, which I'm sure folks are familiar with at this point. Uh, if you've uh, been following the news in Ohio for the past couple of years, uh, sort of this first energy bailout and scandal and dark money. Uh, and so uh, it's really interesting, again, uh, there's been a lot of negative repercussions with this. A lot of folks have been uh, pointing at Ohio and watching what we're doing in sort of a negative way. Uh, we, uh, in addition to sort of this, you know, hey, we need to bail out these nuclear facilities, uh, doing things like slashing our RPS and uh, energy efficiency standards and a lot of other bad things. And so I really, uh, you know, appreciate and commend uh, Tristan and Solar United Neighbors uh, for uh, working on these things. You know, how can we increase transparency? How can we hold utilities uh, to be more accountable? How can we have better and more equitable public policy processes uh, so that uh, this doesn't happen again in the future? And how can we, in essence, prevent a lot of this big money utility corruption and protect ourselves as ratepayers and sort of the broader citizenry, right? So um, my email address is on the bottom for folks uh, who would like to reach out and engage. Uh, again, I know we're going to have a, a Q&A uh, session at the end here, but uh, always happy to make new friends and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to chat about some of my work. So uh, hopefully that was helpful. I will turn it back over to you, Tristan, as our moderator. And thanks, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Gilbert. And uh, hopefully people are thinking about the questions. And those are some great primer questions. And I think we'll be <laughs> uh, digging into that here in just a second as we get to our next speaker. And let me go ahead and pull up his presentation. In fact, it is uh, running right alongside our former slide here. So let me get this set. Boom. I guess as fast as I've ever switched through things. So our next speaker up is David Anderson. He's again with the policy and he's a policy and communications manager for the Energy and Policy Institute digging more into Ohio utility corruption. So David, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good evening. Um, Tristan already said my name and that I work with the Energy and Policy Institute. And just so you know, we're a watchdog group that works to expose utility industry attacks on renewable energy policies in Ohio and also in other states around the country. Um, tonight, I'm just going to take a look at a bill that I'm sure many, if not all of you are familiar with uh, since it's been in the headlines for several years now, um, House Bill 6, which passed in Ohio in 2019. Uh, I won't go through all the details of it, but <clears throat> you're probably aware that it's a billion dollar bailout um, for two nuclear power plants that were once owned by First Energy Solutions, which is now called Energy Harbor, um, as well as billions of dollars in increased 
subsidies um, for some coal plants that are co-owned by AEP, Duke Energy, and a few other major utilities. Also rolled back um, Ohio's energy efficiency and renewable energy requirements for electric utilities, um, which left uh, Ohio with the sort of like um, not so great designation of being the only one of 29 or 30 states that have adopted these standards to actually repeal one. Um, and then it also included some other funky handouts through which uh, First Energy parent company um, of FES was making quite a few million dollars every year, basically for doing nothing. Um, next slide. So before uh, some major breaking news last summer, we already knew as it First Energy worked to pass this bill um, <clears throat> and then after it was enacted, we knew that they'd rang up some pretty hefty legal bills just based on disclosures that were made in First Energy Solutions bankruptcy case uh, about how much they were paying um, their, their top lobbyists to work on the bill. And then we also knew that they'd um, handed out a million dollars or more in campaign cash um, in the years before the bill was passed. Um, you know, just traditional campaign PAC contributions that are still relatively easy to track um, via various disclosure websites. You go to the next slide. And then beyond that traceable money, there was also just a lot of craziness going on after the bill passed. Um, some people in Ohio thought it would be a good idea to start a petition campaign to try to put the bill on the ballot so that voters could have a chance to um, overturn this bailout and clean energy rollback um, when they voted in 2020. And unfortunately, what we saw was a, a really huge dark money campaign just with millions of dollars spent on ads, um, some of which were pretty overtly racist, um, targeting Asian Americans and um, China with really xenophobic messages about how people who were essentially collecting um, signatures to put this issue on the ballot were actually secret Chinese agents coming to your door <clears throat> to try to steal your personal information. It was all pretty ludicrous and I think it, it upset people a lot more than it uh, actually helped out their cause, but they were able to kill that um, petition drive and the issue never reached the ballot. And there were a, a few groups named Generation Now and Ohioans for Energy Security that aside from one or two people who were their spokespeople in the media, it was just kind of like, everyone sort of knew it was first energy money and probably linked to the um, then Ohio Speaker of the House, Larry Householder, but it was really hard to prove that based on like existing documentation. You can go to the next slide. So fast forward to last summer, um, U.S. Attorney David DeLears for the Southern, Southern District of Ohio after the arrest of uh, Larry Householder and several top political operatives in Ohio that morning, um, did a news conference <clears throat> in which he released uh, the findings of a pretty bombshell um, criminal complaint um, that led to the indictment of Householder and a number of his um, lobbyist friends. And essentially what they alleged was that Company A, which based on the description and criminal affidavit that was filed in court and made public, was pretty clearly First Energy had funneled $60 million into a dark money group called Generation Now, which then flowed through some other entities like Ohioans for Energy Security. Um, and that money basically first helped to fuel um, the selection of Larry Householder as Ohio House Speaker in early 2019 by electing a wave of state legislative candidates in 2018 who would support um, his bid for the speakership. And then it was used to pass HB6 um, through like a multi-million dollar ad campaign that hit radio, social media, and other things. Um, and then there were also some weird personal benefits like Larry Householder used some of the money to pay off money that he owed in taxes on a house in Florida. So <laughs> um, this is just a different version of that same thing that a group called IEPA put together. It really helps to show like the kind of insane web of uh, for-profit firms, front groups, and individuals that this money flowed through um, after it passed from First Energy to this top level generation now group that had some public profile. You can go to the next slide. So now that um, Generation Now <clears throat> and two of the lobbyists who are involved in that scheme have pleaded guilty, um, Larry Householder is still 
fighting the charges in court as are I think one other lobbyist. Um, the FBI actually raided the home of Public Utility Commission of Ohio Chairman Sam Randazzo um, and everyone so we're sort of like, well, you know, this must be connected to that other scandal in case. And not long later, um, just a few days actually, First Energy filed a, a document with the SEC in which they disclosed that they'd paid $4.3 million to a consultant shortly before their appointment as an Ohio State utility regulator. And that that individual <clears throat> had basically been on their payroll since 2013. Um, and as a regulator took actions for the benefit and at the request of First Energy um, in their official regulatory capacity. So pretty much as close as you can come to a company uh, publicly admitting that it had bribed a public official um, shortly before their appointment. You can go to the next slide. So where this relationship seems to have gone back to 2013 <clears throat> and Sam Randazzo matched the description of this individual that First Energy was talking about, it's also raised a lot of questions about work he did prior to his appointment as PUCO and also Ohio Power Siting Board Chairman. And the president of the Cleveland City Council is considering um, an investigation, possibly subpoenas to First Energy to see if um, all this was involved in Randazzo's opposition to an offshore wind project um, involving Cleveland public power. And Mr. Randazzo was just also involved in a lot of um, anti-wind groups and activities as a lawyer and lobbyist in the years prior to his appointment, um, but never really disclosed that he was being paid um, behind the scenes for some sort of work by First Energy. So a lot of questions about whether First Energy was kind of funding uh, a person who was touring the state, essentially ginning up opposition to wind turbines. He was also very involved in earlier efforts to roll back Ohio's renewable energy and energy efficiency standards. And these are just a few examples of different groups he operated um, under to do that work. Um, and a funny picture that they had on one website of IE Ohio and a few other sites of how shocked people were by what was really you know, a program that was saving them money through energy efficiency. Next slide. Um, others have fallen at First Energy due to the scandal, including their CEO <clears throat> and a top lobbyist named Michael Dowling. Um, they also separated, and it turns out sounds like actually fired their top uh, ethics officer, <laughs> which sort of makes sense, um, and a top attorney. And then more recently, it appears that they've cut several of their top lobbyists um, who focus exclusively on Ohio for probably obvious reasons. Next slide. Uh, Governor DeWine has also been caught up in the scandal <clears throat> because um, he has admitted that he actually asked First Energy to donate money to um, a few different groups to support his 2018 election um, for governor and also his daughter's race for a county prosecutor position <clears throat> in 2020. Um, he also selected as his top legislative aide a former lobbyist for First Energy who led one of the dark money groups that's mentioned in the um, US attorney's case against Larry Householder. So not a great look there. Um, the other question that's being explored now <clears throat> by the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, Ohio Consumers Council, and also Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is whether um, any ratepayer money was used to pay for this mixed $60 million bribery scheme. <clears throat> and we do know that um, something called the First Energy Service Company, which this money largely flowed through, only donated about, <clears throat> or only reported about $1.2 million in donations and $6.6 .6 million in political contributions during the time that the scandal played out, which is obviously nowhere near $60 million. And uh, my group, the Energy and Policy Institute, did an analysis that suggested that essentially um, First Energy has been improperly accounting for a lot of lobbying spending for a number of years and has been collecting many millions of dollars from ratepayers. Um, each year in different states as a result. Next slide. Uh, you can actually skip this one. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so here we can see just some of the regulatory entities and also law enforcement agencies that are now looking into um, this first energy scandal. Even as far away as New Jersey, regulators are starting to take a look under the hood of the first energy utility there, Jersey Central Power and Light, <clears throat> and ask 
hey, did money that they paid to this first energy service company that funded this big bribery scheme come from ratepayers here? And they're doing a, a big audit there around that and other issues. Um, Securities and Exchange Commission essentially looking at information that First Energy did or did not disclose accurately to its shareholders around all this over the years. Um, FERC, I mentioned, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has an investigation and audit now focused on this issue. And then, of course, the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, which isn't exactly looking sterling out of all this, uh, and the Department of Justice. And the next slide. I just wanted to briefly mention that AEP has also um, been found to have provided some money to the Stark Money Group generation now that's at the center of um, the federal corruption case. Um, and this is just an extract from a new um, code of ethics for essentially um, politics and lobbying that AEP published this year. And there's various versions of it on their website, but they define um, bribes as including gifts, campaign contributions, charitable contributions, food and beverage, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are exchanged with public policy makers in exchange for some sort of benefit. Um, you can go to the next page. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen that AEP itself also funded a different dark money group that has purchased food and beverages, um, as they call it, to improve the efficiency of um, Governor DeWine's meetings at the governor's mansion um, with different companies and lobbyists and stakeholders um, by buying food and beverages and entertainment for those meetings. Also gave $900,000 to the, some of those dark money groups that are linked to the HB6 scandal. And of course, <clears throat> ton of uh, campaign cash um, to different politicians involved in getting the bill passed, including um, some at Larry Harder, Larry Householder's fairly notoriously um, lavish birthday parties. Next page. And this is just my contact info. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. My email address is down there. And you can also check out our website um, for lots more background information on this issue, energyandpolicy.org. And I'll turn it back to Kristen, or Tristan, sorry. Thank you, David. Um, now that we're all thoroughly depressed, <laughs> uh, you know, hearing that all in one, one foul swoop certainly uh, gives you pause, right? Um, but fortunately, we have Randy coming up next with uh, a little bit about how to set the framework here, how we begin to fix some of these issues, and uh, she'll give us uh, some hope here. Right? <laughs> no pressure though, right, Tristan? <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> well, great. Thanks. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, like Tristan said, my name is Randy Leffler, and I'm the Vice President of Energy Policy with the Ohio Environmental Council. Um, and I'm really glad to be here today um, alongside two such wonderful speakers. Um, I've worked with Gilbert many times and, and Dave as well, uh, you know, and really appreciate their perspectives on this and the framework they've set up. Um, so I, like Tristan said, I'm joining you tonight uh, to try to give you some hope <laughs> and to talk about some ways that we can really fix some of the problems we've seen, um, both at the PUCO and with our political framework uh, that we really, you know, created a perfect storm for something like House Bill 6 to happen. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Tristan. Um, so first, just quickly a little bit on OEC. Um, we celebrated our 50th birthday a couple, couple years ago, so we're 52 now, and our mission is to secure healthy land, air, and water for all who call Ohio home. And um, our goal in doing this, we uh, craft smart policy solutions that are based in science. Um, we're a pragmatic organization and we advocate through uh, both policy and legal work for those uh, through our family of organizations, which also includes the OEC Action Fund, which is our lobbying arm. So we do also have a C4, which is uh, one of the topics we've been talking about, but um, we are all in for reform of C4, as I just wanna note. Um, and if you're interested in that, I've got a link here that our general counsel, um, drafted and I think it's important given the topic area we're on right now. So if you're interested, check that out later. Um, but um, okay, next slide, thank you. Um, so as you heard from Gilbert and Dave a little bit, um, House Bill 6 was really disastrous for our environment. Um, it subsidized aging and inefficient nuclear plants, dirty coal plants, removed our clean energy standards, um, and you know gave other handouts to First Energy that are complicated and um, some of which have been repealed now. But um, it was just basically a backwards piece of legislation for anybody that really is hoping for a clean energy future for our state. Um, in addition to what we know now, which is this is the biggest corruption scandal we've seen in the state of Ohio. Um, so next slide. 
Um, but this slide really, you know, is just showing what we've lost as a result of this. Um, we were on track to reduce our carbon pollution by 10 million tons between 2017 and 2019, I'm sorry, 2029. Um, but because of House Bill 6 and despite House Bill 128, which I think I just saw someone uh, put a question in the chat box about that, despite uh, that becoming law with the governor's signature this week, it was merely a partial repeal. Um, we will still no longer have our energy waste reduction programs, energy efficiency. Um, we'll no longer have the clean energy goal for our utilities, and we're still bailing out uh, the dirty coal plants. So uh, House Bill 128 didn't address any of those issues. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Tristan. Now the happy part, or at least the proactive part. <laughs> um, so what, what can we do to prevent this from ever happening again? Um, you know, the House Bill 6 scandal really exposed really deep corruption at a level we've never really seen in Ohio. We've seen scandals over the, over the course of history, but this one really took the cake. Um, but it didn't just expose that, um, you know, when you're really looking at this, it really exposed some deep structural flaws, uh, both in the utility regulatory system, um, and also just that it, it's just devoid of adequate oversight, we see. Um, so that, you know, the arrests, the plea agreements, firings that Dave was talking about, um, all the different lawsuits and uh, potential new law enforcement actions uh, just make it really, really clear that if we don't address the underlying uh, monopoly utility culture that contributed to this scandal um, and provide that really, really necessary oversight to prevent and detect future issues before they escalate, we won't fix the problem. So we can repeal this and, and, and that would be great if we got a full repeal. Um, we really have to look at how to prevent this in the future or else it will happen again. So you know, Ohio desperately needs reforms in several places, and I fit them into kind of three buckets, accountability, transparency, and equity. Um, and so the first, you know, we really need some reforms at the Public Utilities Commission to block the utility dominance um, and to really make it work for Ohioans again. Um, there's a very, very small group of players there, frankly, um, and the utilities are the ones that are there every single step of the way. Um, Second, we really, really need some increased transparency and accountability in the process of the legislature. Um, I think it's really difficult um, for just the general public to navigate, and yet we're supposed to be a representative democracy. It shouldn't be that hard for us to participate, and it shouldn't be that hard to understand who else is participating behind the scenes. Um, and finally, you know, some campaign finance reforms and reporting, because dark money is just so prevalent um, in politics now, is really, really necessary. So to kind of take the PUCO, the legislature, and, and some of the campaign finance reforms in, in pieces, um, as Dave mentioned, the former chair of the PUCO, which is responsible directly for overseeing utilities and tasked with holding them accountable, um, you know, now has been tied directly to the utilities he was supposed to be regulating. Um, and the rest of the commissioners, and he's gone uh, for now, but the rest of the commissioners are the same um, other than the new chair who was just appointed, Jennifer French. Um, and Governor DeWine, uh, when he appointed her, touted her as having no energy or utility background whatsoever, which is a drastic change from when he appointed uh, Chair Randazzo and was touting his extreme background and knowledge around the issue. And so, you know, it would be great to have a happy medium where we could have someone that wasn't tied directly to utilities or beholden to them, um, but at the same time have someone that has a background. Um, I will say that, you know, she was a judge for a number of years, and so I have high hopes that she'll apply the rule of law, and so we're looking forward to, to getting to know her um, and hope that some of these changes that I'm talking about from the PUCO can be implemented through the PUCO, but a lot of these will have to be legislative fixes that I'm going to talk about. Um, so first, audits and investigations. Um, this is a really first and obvious component that we need stronger audits and investigations of any utility that engages in the type of activity uh, First Energy is shown here. And Dave was uh, mentioning some of the different things that are going on there right now. Um, there are several investigations pending, um, but they're broken up into multiple cases. So there's one that's looking at political and charitable contributions. Um, there's one looking at a recently expanded now audit um, into the First Energy Utilities delivery services and whether, uh, like Dave was saying, those were used um, improperly. Um, and then there's an audit of the distribution modernization writer, which was a big point of contention as well. Um, but these multiple cases are making it difficult to kind of parse out where discovery lives uh, for the attorneys there. And we're involved in this too. Um, and you know, we've filed along with our partners at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, um, a motion to expand the investigation. And, and we'd like to see these all combined into one because um, it needs to be more robust. It needs to be more transparent and it needs to be thorough. And it's tough to do that when they're in, in piecemeal cases like this. Um, another component is that the public really should have a voice in some of these proceedings. Um, and in these investigations, that would be wonderful because the public's who's being impacted by these shady dealings. And so we'd like to see a component added like that. Um, in addition to that, um, 
I think that would be really critical for whatever the audit uh, is done at the Public Utilities Commission to be provided those results to be provided to the General Assembly, um, because they need to be able to make informed decisions. One of the biggest one of the biggest components of House Bill Six was that they kept saying First Energy needed a bailout, but they weren't requiring any uh, financial disclosure. So how would you even know if they needed that? Um, you know, uh, so it made the entire process difficult from the start. And certainly if they are shown to have this type of behavior, there should be a, a very serious audit at the end. Um, so, you know, but again, you know, investigations aren't just the answer. We need remedies if it's discovered to hold them accountable. So, you know, we really need penalties. We need customer refunds. Um, there should be reviews of their franchise agreements and whether they should be operating in the state of Ohio still if they're egregious violations like this. Um, you know, maybe some probationary measures that could be implemented. Um, things like that uh, would be really great tools for our regulators to have to hold monopolies accountable. And if we don't have those tools to hold them accountable, there's really no penalty for them, right? So uh, as far as equity uh, at the Public Utilities Commission, you know, there need to be better safeguards against some of these big rate increases we've seen through electric security plans. Um, so that's something we'd like to see change. The other component is that the, the settlement process, and I won't get too far into this because it's technical and I don't want to bore people because I know I could nerd out on this uh, all night, but um, <laughs> the settlement process at the commission really gives the utilities kind of excessive leverage um, over consumer advocates and public interest advocates like the OEC and others that get involved there um, and allows them to kind of uh, make uh, special dispensations to get certain folks onto those stipulations and settlement agreements. Um, so I really think that those need to be tightened um, before any kind of a settlement can be adopted. Um, additionally, um, the process for uh, appointing a commissioner, uh, there's a nominating council. And right now, uh, there's too much utility dominance there um, and too much uh, flexibility. And we really should have more uh, stringent requirements about public uh, advocates and consumer advocates being part of that. So that would be a really important step as well. Um, and then next, just uh, looking at the legislature and what we can do there. Um, you know, the legislative response to this, the scandal so far, um, as far as uh, legislatively, has really focused on the bill's individual policy provisions that were related directly to first energy. So we've seen now with House Bill 128, a repeal of the nuclear subsidies, the decoupling provision that was unfair, the significantly excessive earnings test. Um, and there were a number of bills that were also proposed that were full repeals or related to the OVEC coal subsidies and the standards, but those didn't move at all. Um, but over and above any of that, there was very little attention paid to the kind of structural reforms that we're talking about here. Um, the things that we need to safeguard and put in place um, to make sure that we have accountability, transparency and equity for Ohio. Um, so we really need um, to have some of this done by the legislature, as I was saying. Um, but a lot of this also goes to the heart of this, which is the money problem, right, in politics. And um, some good government groups like Common Cause Ohio, if you guys don't know them, you should check them out. They're doing some really, really great work um, speaking up about what it would take to have a really transparent, equitable process at the legislature. Um, so, you know, Citizens United, we've got a dark money problem. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, aside from overturning a Supreme Court ruling, um, you know, groups have been advocating for different types of methods. So um, different ways to require disclosures of funding sources for political ads, because I know we've all seen the ads and uh, it, there's very little information that comes along with who it's from. Um, required disclosures of top funders on political ads, um, campaign finance, increased campaign finance filings, um, requiring uh, public disclosure, disclosure, this is a big one. Um, so one of the problems with transparency at the legislature is that, um, you know, we've got political donations coming in, we can't see where they're from. And then in addition to that, when bills get drafted, they're drafted by the Legislative Services Commission. And all of that is private unless the legislator who is having the bill drafted chooses to make it public. It is privileged and we cannot see it. And so we have no way to know who's helping influence a bill or helping write the bill itself. Um, and so I know Common Cause and I think a few other groups are pushing for a bill and they were naming it um, after a, a watchdog reporter, Jim Siegel, who uh, unexpectedly passed away uh, not too long ago, um, pushing for this kind of public disclosure so people would have more understanding of what is going on behind the scenes. Um, so several other things like this, and then, you know, other types of uh, public advertising disclosures would be really great to see um, 
And then also making sure uh, lobbyists provide campaign contribution information um, along with their lobbying filings. Um, because, you know, we've seen a lot of that come out in the days after the scandal broke um, that, you know, a lobbyist had donated X amount of dollars, things like that. And it should be really easy for people to look up because it's not right now. Um, and then just a really baseline thing that I wanted to point out that happened to some folks this last week. It's really difficult to even figure out how you're supposed to submit testimony. If you want to have your voice heard at the, at the legislature and you don't have groups like uh, you know, Solar United sending you the, the witness slip and you don't have someone helping you with uh, talking points because not most most people in the world are not uh, gifted in reading legislative, uh, you know, background and it gets complicated and it's difficult to understand exactly what these bills do. Um, so, you know, just something that makes it a lot more, uh, you know, transparent for um, for the public to get involved in the state house process, I think is really, really important. Um, and that doesn't take legislation, to be clear. That could be done very, very easily. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to hit on was equity, um, just generally. Um, when we talk about a clean energy future and when we talk about reforming corruption, we are talking about making things more equitable. Um, you know, uh, as far as the environmental side, dirtier air, more expensive bills is going to impact all of us. And that's what's going to happen with House Bill 6. Um, but it's going to impact our environmental justice communities the hardest. And so, you know, we have opportunities to move toward a zero carbon future uh, to fight climate change, but we can do it in a way that uplifts all Ohioans. Um, and so we can have job creators while we're also uh, cleaning up the environment. And so we need to look at it from that framework instead of pitting jobs against the environment, because that's a false uh, dichotomy. So, you know, there are 114,000 clean energy jobs as of last year, and a lot of these are at risk now um, because of House Bill 6, but we have amazing wind and solar resources in the state. And if we really leaned into those, we could grow the number of good paying jobs um, and we could prioritize uh, BIPOC and women owned firms in the planning and procurement processes and really make uh, Ohio a more equitable place to be. Um, so, you know, those are the types of things um, that actually we've seen uh, happening over in a neighboring state over in Illinois um, with the Clean Energy Jobs uh, Act. And so they're really prioritizing this as um, a clean energy future, but also as a job creator um, and making sure those jobs are here uh, in their state. And so I think there's a lot of good lessons we can learn from them as well. Um, so next slide, Tristan. So just to wrap up, um, you know, I've talked about a number of different things and, um, you know, we really need some of those revisions, like I said, are going to be Ohio law changes, um, but that would help us get this accountability and transparency and equity um, that would really ensure an energy landscape that exists to serve everybody in Ohio and not utilities and cronyism, which is what we've seen with the House Bill 6 scandal. Um, so, you know, until, um, you know, our clean energy standards, like I said, had been supporting all of those jobs, over 100,000 jobs, it saved Ohio in $7.06 billion um, as a result of our decrease in energy consumption. And, um, you know, Ohioans really have the right uh, to have energy systems and regulations in place that serve them and don't just serve the utilities. So um, I will pause there and my contact info is here. If anybody um, wants to reach out, I'm happy to chat too. Excellent. Thank you, Randy, for that very um great encapsulation of, of all the things going on that could potentially be going on to uh, to get us to a, a better energy future, a clean energy future, so and a less corrupt energy future. So uh, with that, let's move straight into, we have a little bit of time left, about 15 minutes, and that's great. Uh, some Q&A, and we've got some great questions in the chat. Uh, in fact, one uh, Randy actually um, mentioned, and, and I want to start with that one. Uh, Chris Wagner asks, about uh, HB 128, I think we've gotten into that a little bit, um, but uh, I think the last part of this question here is excellent and, and really one that I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I, I was going to ask as well. Uh, you know, this was a partial win. How do we get more of these wins? What leads to more wins? Uh, and what can ratepayers do or energy professionals uh, to continue getting wins like uh, 128 and, and some of the things that you mentioned, Randy, and I'll open that up to Anybody on the panel who wants to jump in? Well, I'm happy to jump in. I just had just been talking for a while, so I didn't want to keep talking if someone had something to, to raise. But, you know, um, in the lame duck uh, session last year, you know, there was a lot of movement originally on a full repeal. 
and then I don't know, you know, inertia hit or something. And it, it's always tough to get good legislation passed during a lame duck session, which, you know, means a lot of the legislators are leaving um, and, and there's a lot less time for them to get things done. So, you know, because of that inertia, I think we didn't see anything happen last year. And then when people came back, I honestly think people were tired to some degree. Um, and uh, House Bill 128 really addressed the very specific pieces that were uh, directly uh, First Synergy's wins. Um, and so I think, you know, for even legislators that um, had voted yes, there were obviously enough to overturn parts of that. And I think they were looking at it from, you know, this is First Synergy's mess. These are pieces they obviously got for themselves. We've got to repeal these. Um, but I would say what's frustrating um, about it is that, you know, the 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 losers here are the clean energy standards and the coal subsidies being extended that were lumped in along with First Energy's game. Um, so it's really unfortunate for all of us. And so we really do need to keep pushing for a full repeal. And I know organizations like Solar United Neighbors and OEC and others, um, you know, will will let you guys know anytime there's something like this coming up where you can join in the fight. Um, and I think that that's really important, but calling your legislator is really important too. I know folks don't think that's always that effective, but it is. And especially during a pandemic, phone calls, um, I think have been really important. And you can request a meeting with your legislator and I, I really think it matters. Great. Another question, after all the findings and firings, is HB6 still law and why? Maybe this is a good question for David Anderson. Sure. Um, well, I think that we saw just this week the nuclear bailout portion of it and a couple other things that primarily benefited First Energy were repealed and Governor DeWine signed that. Um, but unfortunately, that repeal left in place, as um, Randy just mentioned, the coal subsidies um, piece of the bill and also the rollback of the clean energy standards, um, the latter of which was something that First Energy had sought for a very long time. So little unclear as to why um, that's being left on the table and obviously a win for First Energy and the other utilities. I think the coal piece um, unfortunately remains on the table in part because the uh, companies that own those coal plants like AEP has re have really filled in the gap left by First Energy's um, sort of pause in lobbying and PAC spending since the federal investigation was announced um, and continue to pour money at least um, during the lame duck session last year even into the committee members who served on a committee that was tasked with repealing this bill. Um, so usually you can follow uh, where that campaign money is um, going and understand what their lobbyists are also targeting, um, you know, with their personal communications um, and cozying up to lawmakers. So they're still, uh, still standing victorious and we'll see if other bills aimed at uh, repealing that OVEC coal subsidies piece of the, the bill move forward this year. So a follow up on that to kind of put a finer point on it. What does um, HB6 as it stands, as it's written, as it's enacted and in, enforced and in law mean for the average rate payer in terms of what they're paying for or not paying for? Well, I can, I can weigh in on that a little bit. So um, there is one of the things that I've seen touted in some of the stories on House Bill 128 so far is this, that First Energy is going to refund some of the money. Um, what they are refunding are the uh, charges that were collected for the decoupling provision. Um, this is a this is not a policy that we're opposed to in theory. It basically decouples the amount of energy that the utility sells from their profits. And what that does is allow them or allow us to continue to invest in energy efficiency um, without the utility uh, you know, having money problems, frankly, because that is kind of how it's been done in the past. And so what we wanna do as advocates for energy efficiency is make sure we're pushing for reduced consumption. And so that's what the decoupling provision uh, does. But the problem with what, uh, and all the utilities had one other than First Energy, and what First Energies did was give them the hottest year, which gave them the largest profits and codified it in law, where the other utilities actually went through a process at the commission to make sure it was fair for ratepayers. And so that's the money that's being refunded. Um, the other pieces like the nuclear subsidy um, and, and the uh, significantly excess of earning tests, um, the nuclear subsidies had never been collected. So there won't be refunds for that, but you will never be charged for that now. And the reason that there were no, uh, nothing collected on that was because of the lawsuits that had been filed and uh, there were injunctions filed. So those couldn't start to be collected uh, January 1 as they were supposed to under House Bill 6. 
But so everybody will still continue to see the OVEC subsidies on their bills. Um, and you will not see the energy efficiency and renewable uh, portfolio standards being charged on your bills now. And that kind of answers, I think, uh, maybe Valerie's question. But in fact, um, if you want to take a look at Valerie's question, uh, Gilbert, and, and, and maybe Randy, you can kind of follow up on, um, on, on Deborah's question here, which is, I think a lot of folks have this question, these delivery charges, even though we may not be paying much, we may not have uh, much in utility bills in the way of usage, there's these these delivery charges that seem to keep going up. Uh, how can these be re remedied? Where do they come from? What's the deal? Yeah, I mean, the, the utility bills are very complicated, I know, and it's frustrating. And it's that is another thing that we uh, talk about a lot is trying to make them more readable and user friendly um, because it shouldn't be that confusing for folks. Um, but the delivery charges, uh, so right now AEP, for example, is going through a rate case. And when we go through those charges or those types of cases, they look at the holistic approach of how the utility um, basically makes ends meet while providing the service for Ohioans. Um, and those are usually dealt with as part of rate cases. Um, and uh, I know we had several folks weigh in um, to make sure that the charges weren't going up on, on AEP. And I know there were several folks that weighed in a few years ago when there was a fixed charge increase that was happening. Um, but you know, some of these types of charges, they're different. There's the distribution charges, there's the transmission charges. Um, so it gets complicated quickly, but I will say that um, you know, it's all regulated by the Public Utilities Commission for the most part. And so um, you know, weighing in at the Public Utilities Commission, and like I said, it, it gets confusing quickly, but I'm happy to, to talk about it offline as well if, if you wanna talk. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and Gilbert, so uh, maybe you can give us a, a super brief explanation of what the renewable energy standards were that were repealed in HB6 and, and maybe some steps towards getting those reinstated in the future as we try to unwind more parts of HB6? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to make sure I get the numbers right so Randy, you can chime in. But I believe that the RPS, which has been a mess for many years, by the way, right? It was frozen for a couple of years and then it, and it came back. And uh, I believe the figure was 12.5% by 2026, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, Randy, did that get slashed at eight and a half percent? Is that the correct number? I don't want to uh, misspeak here. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so eight and a half percent. So we basically, uh, you know, the clean energy standard RPS for folks who are unaware is sort of a state level legislative mandate for utilities uh, that are regulated by the PUCO. So the big IOUs to have a certain percent of their generation from uh, what's defined as renewable energy by a certain date, right? And so um, it was really frustrating to see that as part of uh, this HB6 mess. And there's a lot of other things around uh, whether RPSs are the best path forward for states, right? There's sort of ancillary pieces that happen where, uh, you know, maybe sometimes the utilities aren't even building uh, a lot of these generation assets themselves, but rather they're buying the recs from other folks that are, uh, you know, building rooftop distributed PV and other types of generation, uh, which can be a good thing. But um, there's other ways around uh, sort of these uh, uh, utility, you know, financial repercussions or penalties. And I know Randy, you were talking about that as well. And those are the ways that they can work around sort of these legislative mandates uh, as well, which is a challenge. David, did you have a follow up on that? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think um, the main way that these attacks on Ohio's renewable energy and energy efficiency standards have been successful has really been at limiting those um, policies from being made stronger. Um, you can look at a lot of other states where these attacks have been less successful and the cost of the similar programs have proven to be pretty minimal and obviously renewable energy and energy efficiency are hugely popular with most people. Um, so to the extent that um, you know Ohio's RPS was never that big to begin with, I think that's partly just because we've seen this over a decade of attacks on those programs that really go pretty far and above what we've seen in other states that have now moved their RPS up to 50% or you know even 100%. Good. We have another question here about what, what can we do now? Where can we plug in? Uh, you know, how can we know what's going on about these different uh, actions or things happening? And I think the best answer I have for that is I, you know, follow. Also, leave it to neighbors. We're we're keeping up as as best as possible with uh, all the different all the different bills and things going on. I, I think Ohio Environmental Council is probably a step ahead of us in all those. If you join their mailing lists, uh, follow them on Twitter, things like that, you can definitely um, get the best information about how to plug into 
um, fighting the bad things and helping along the good things as they come up. Um, and there'll certainly be a follow-up discussion. We're gonna absolutely send an email out to everyone who uh, signed up for this with some links, uh, as well as some, some actions you might be able to get involved in. So you can look forward to that if you don't wanna uh, do anything right now and continue to listen. So, um, and that's fine. So let's keep moving here. Uh, Becca asks, how can, how can we ensure that the company we get electricity from is truly providing renewable energy? I'll let anyone take that who wants it. Randy? I figure I thought Gilbert might weigh in on it. That's why I was going to pause. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can start. I'll jump in. OK, so yeah, you can shop for your energy, as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, and there, the Public Utilities Commission has a website that's called Apples to Apples. But I will it, I will be the first to tell you it's not super user friendly. Um, it's tough. But you can sort um, through that uh, with um, you know, by type of energy provided and what the plan is, but it gets really confusing quickly because there are fixed rates and then there's variable rates and things like that. Um, so, so there are options there. Um, another option is Arcadia Power. Um, they actually, um, you can do 50% uh, renewables um, and they retire the recs. So, you know, you're not actually just uh, duplicating efforts of other people. Um, so they'll actually retire the recs after you purchase the en energy. Um, so they're a great company. Um, and that's actually who I get my power from. So I'm not pitching them. That's just someone that I'm familiar with and like. Um, but I, and, and they're doing a great job. You can look and see where they're uh, helping to build additional projects and things like that. But um, I will say we get that question all the time at the OEC. So I'm happy to follow up with you as well if you want to email me because we've got a, a pretty form email by this point of uh, trying to help people through some of that. And if you're in a NOPEC city uh, or a SOPEC city, you um, can shop on those individual aggregator websites for clean energy. Uh, that's what I do. And uh, I like what David Carpenter said, put solar on your roof. Yes, that's the best way to ensure you're getting local clean energy. As, as Randy does, as I do, as, as David does. In fact, um, Ben, if you're back there somewhere, can you unmute David Carpenter? He's got a couple of questions I see here. And um, maybe it's best if you, because I think a couple of your questions kind of got partially answered, but if you still have some questions, David, uh, maybe we can, you can kind of chime in here and, and ask away. I can't get out of the presentation, so I can't unmute you, but, but Ben can. There it is. Go ahead, go ahead, David. I think you still need to unmute yourself there in the bottom corner, but you can do it now. Go ahead and unmute yourself and fire away. In two places, I'm sorry. Okay, now I get it. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, my big concerns is all the publicity was about the nuclear plants and now House Bill 128 sort of solves that problem. And I fear in the public's mind that, oh, the problem's solved because OVEC and uh, the energy efficiency and the renewable energy standards, you know, we're not in the news quite as much. And, you know, I'm really concerned because um, one, I, I guess my question, main questions are, are about OVEC and, and that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, did not HB6 guarantee OVEC profitability uh, that, that they would be able to, to charge what they needed to remain profitable? And so, like, doesn't that make it impossible for us as Ohioans to deal with a little bit of our coal energy production as long as that stands? And uh, particularly concerned about just who and what OVEC is, because to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, OVEC is owned by the electric companies that it sells power to, not in direct proportion exactly, but roughly in proportion to uh, who it sells to. So it seems like just this entity that is impossible to deal with unless somebody else knows how to do that and can explain that. That would be, that's the gist of my question. Anyone want to take that? that that's a lot. Randy? Yeah, um, well, I guess I kind of heard two parts of your question. How do we get more attention on this? Because it really didn't get a lot of attention. And you're right, um, you know, the OVEC provision in particular was slipped in last minute to House Bill 6, and there was no debate uh, whatsoever about it. Um, 
And, you know, when it was slipped in there, it really looked like it was kind of a, like a fix for the other utilities that weren't getting any handouts in House Bill 6 because First Energy was getting the bulk of them. But actually the way it worked out, uh, First Energy now also has an ownership piece. And so they are also getting subsidized uh, as part of the co-owners for the OVEC plants. Um, and the, those OVEC plants, to your other point, or other kind of question, uh, they are co-owned by a lot of different entities. And, um, you know, the, the four, uh, the four uh, EDUs, so First Energy, DPNL, uh, Dayton Power and Light, I'm sorry, um, uh, AEP and Duke, um, all have to file these reports at the commission that uh, claim they've tried to sell their shares. Um, but there's really not a lot of information given about how they tried. They just basically file a one page letter saying they didn't, they couldn't get rid of it. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure who really wants to buy. Uh, share in an aging coal plant at this point. Um, but, um, you know, trying to get rid of those and, and, and shut them down is never going to happen if they continue to be artificially subsidized. And so uh, those two different plants, um, you know, the three utilities other than First Energy, when they all had subsidies already through the Public Utilities Commission, they ended in 2023, 2024, and 2025, depending on which utility you're talking about. Um, but now those have been extended in House Bill 6 through 2030. And so, um, you know, it's a real problem. We're artificially propping up a form of generation that is uh, closing all over the country. Um, so I'm not sure if I completely answered your question, but I tried. <laughs> yeah, may I, may I continue on that point? Because I'm pretty sure that Buckeye Power gets a significant amount of its energy from those plants and has a significant ownership as well. And Buckeye Power is able to rotate some of its uh, trustees into the legislature, in and out of the legislature on a regular basis in Eastern Ohio. So how much is Buckeye Power responsible for what happened there? That's a great question. Um, and you're right, uh, Buckeye Power and others also co-own shares of that. Um, it's interesting because the those types of entities uh, versus the uh, the EDUs, like the the you know investor-owned utilities, um, are are less. Uh, it's it's you see them less, I guess I'll say, or at least you're aware of them less at the state house until things like this pop up, and surely they don't want that set set aside because um, they want to maintain those shares and. If AEP and Duke and everybody were able to get out of those, um, I'm not sure who would bear the brunt of the ownership, but the the subsidy wouldn't necessarily transfer to those folks. Great, thank you, Andy. Thank you, David. Some really great questions. Um, I see a couple of questions, and we're almost uh, you know we're a little bit past time. I see a few of these questions. Whoever anonymous attendee is, uh, I really like you talking about how we should get people uh, worked up and, and really work every angle to get HB six. Uh, re revoked, um, and believe me, we are, and we do, and are working with the communications group to do more about getting folks worked up. and And Randy and I both know we've been we've been <laughs> working at this every angle for a very long time, uh, and we will continue to do so. And we'll, we're going to try to find more new and better ways to 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 help get this done. So thank you for that. Uh, actually, one thing maybe uh, Randy or because um, we've we've seen some class action lawsuits attempted. Maybe you want to talk to that just like real brief. About um, about some of the other angles out there, folks have taken to to try to do the civil route, to getting some of this, um, you know, to attack these utilities and in a way that hurts to get them to re revoke this law, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know, Dave. If you want to weigh in on this, um, I know you've been tracking some of the the SEC filings and things like that. I don't know if you maybe have thoughts on this too, so I'll defer to you. But I, I can weigh in as well. I'm um, sorry, what was the question? Shareholder? Yeah, so there's been some uh, civil lawsuits, shareholder, or maybe even, I know it was kicked around and tossed around uh, solar homeowners for the repeal of the uh, RPS, which reduced our um, subsidy we got for, for generating uh, solar energy, uh, potentially suing. Uh, so just can you give a brief sort of synopsis of, of what happened to those suits, if they're still out there and if that's still viable means to get this uh, some kind of some kind of justice through civil civil routes. Oh yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. One of my kids was uh, approaching the door. <laughs> um, so yeah, th there is a ratepayer class action lawsuit filed by some folks in Ohio that weren't too happy about 
having to pay um, some of the HP6 charges on their bill um, currently or in the future. And that's actually moved forward faster than some of the other lawsuits that we've seen filed by um, First Energy shareholders that were upset that they lost money when First Energy's share price crashed when the scandal broke last year. Um, and I think First Energy is kind of being tricksy now. They gave back, um, or they say they're going to refund some of the money that they've already collected through something called like the HB6 decoupling um, rider. And that seems to be in part to get out ahead of this case and say, oh, well, we can't actually owe ratepayers any money because we don't have any of it anymore. Um, and maybe obviously a benefit of being able to say that would be they'd be able to avoid any like interest and um, you know big legal fines that the court might assign on that. So always super sneaky, um, but the judge in that case does seem open to moving forward with discovery and other um, things that could help pop the lid open on this thing even more than already has been. Well, thank you, David, Gilbert, Randy, for popping on and, and, and sharing this incredibly valuable informational uh, panel and, and a great discussion. Thank you, everyone who attended and, and, and had some great questions. I know we didn't get to everybody and all of their questions, but uh, I think we got to the vast majority. And thanks again. And we're this is all recorded. We'll make sure that everybody out there has a, a recording of this uh, presentation. We're going to send it out in the link after we're done, as well as some helpful information of ways to get plugged in to continue to combat utility corruption and how you might be a part of that movement. So I want to thank you all again, and uh, and I, I bid you adieu. Have a good night, and we'll talk.